welcome to Close Up with the Hollywood Reporter Comedy Showrunners. I'm Lacey Rose, and I'd like to welcome Kenya Barris, Liz Feldman, Rob McElhaney, Tony McNamara, Amy Sherman Palladino, Greg Daniels. Let's get started. As a storyteller in the year 2020, what do you guys see as your biggest challenge? <laughs> well, I'm lucky because my show is in 1960, so it, it, take it away, the rest of you. It's, 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 I, I mean, the, the idea of having to deal with what's going on in the world, it's just, I mean, that is a, that's a tall order. You know, I'm, I'm dealing with the Kennedys running for president, so, you know. <laughs> One of the things that um, we're struggling with right now, because we were in the middle of production, but we basically had to throw all those scripts out for season two. Not completely, but um, we have to obviously adjust for the world being completely different as we, as we return. It's a lot of predict, trying to predict the future. What is, it's an office comedy, so what does an office even look like? Right. Um, so those are the kinds of challenges that we're, we're wrestling with right now. Well, the paper came out today, so you can uh, read that and uh, see mm -hmm. what it's gonna look like. It's, uh, <laughs> A lot of swabs up people's noses. There's just going to be a lot of swabbing. I think one of the things that's hard is that, you know, we've, at least for, for me, is everything that came out now but was shot and written last year before a lot of the, the, the things that have shaken our world here. So you, you hope that the, the message was good enough to still apply no matter what. But, it, it, you know, these, these kind of streaming programs are not very nimble. They're all shot and edited and then dumped like a year or two later. So it's hard to be like SNL. As, as, as I look towards like a potential season three, because we're not quite there yet, I think my challenge is like to be emotionally relevant because in a show like Dead to Me, we're not telling topical kind of rip from the headlines stories anyway. But what I always try to do is sort of gather a sense of a collective emotional place where we tell our stories from. In season one, for, for me, it was I was coming from a place of grief and loss, and that is very much what the show is about. You know, our show's about death, really, rather than, I think, tell a literal story that maybe reflects everything that we're going through. I would aim to, hopefully, somehow, tell a story that is emotionally resonant you know, which is going to be challenging, um, just to just to maintain that kind of relevance. You know, in a in a time when things are so intense and you know important, and um, yeah, it's going to be a challenge. But I also think that that one thing that comedy has going for it that straight dramas don't is I think people are going to be so desperate to be entertained and to laugh and to have some sort of release. We have a catharsis that I don't know that dramas have. Like if, if I'm running any sort of cop show right now, I'm like, well, I'm, you know, and scene. <laughs> <laughs> There's an element of, you know, I mean, of universal stories like death, loss, family, um, you know, of workplace and people interacting with each other and, and we also are, are, we're, you know, we're baggy pants, you know, we're here to like say, it's okay, the world is, is crazy, but sit down for a minute, relax and laugh a little. It's okay to laugh a little. And I think that that's, it's kind of a, I don't know, I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of like, thank God we have, like, that's kind of our role. You know, our role is to like, mm -hmm. do great stories, but also to say like, it's all right, you know, snort something out of your nose, it's fine. <laughs> what, have you, what about you, Kenya? It's interesting for me because, you know, I have the network stuff that's, you know, that is, I, it's completely, you know, they're all different genres. But for instance, on Grownish, that is a show, you know, about the idea of like what college life is like, you know, and saying something, you know, there are amazing obstacles in telling a college story about relationships and hookups and, and you know, things that, you know, college kids are sort of right involved in everything going on right now. It's really ama you know, amazing obstacles to that because there's a Zoom room, so I was asking you guys about that. A lot of those conversations are started because of things that people come in and talk about what they went through. We have a really young writer's room, but like the, when it airs, it won't air until next year, the, the, the season we're writing now. And it's like, do you write, you know, how will college parties be? You know what I'm saying? We have no, I have no idea how will college parties be. You know, the, it will air after a change of, of presidency. We don't know what, you know, 
what you know what the social sort of distancing looks like in college parties. The same thing, blackish. We try to be be a little bit more evergreen. It's not as serialized, but the whole nature of what blackish is is sort of talking about upper middle class family, talking about sort of how that represents and how it affects their life. We don't know. I I want to make people laugh. The very special episodes that we would do were were we got to do that. We got to do you know, a show about a riot or a show about an election or something, and they, were, they, they resonated. But now it's just become a part of our life, you know, and you just want to be funny. And that's ultimately, you know, comedy gets to, gives you the spoon full of sugar to, to take the medicine down with, you know what I'm saying? Black AF, I don't know when, you know, we don't know exactly when it's going to air and things like that. So the idea of banking episodes that you, that the whole purpose of it was sort of to say things and to kind of start a conversation and we don't kind of know what that conversation is going to be. So it, it's, it's difficult. You know, I actually, it's interesting. I love being at Netflix and I love, you know, what they do, but they played an episode, an old episode of Blackish the other night. It was about, you know, a family sitting down sort of proscenium style and watching an episode of like, you know, um, a trial from police brutality or whatever. And we did an episode when Trump got elected and we were able to really rush it and, and got it from script to, to air in 16 days. And like, there was a part of me that in terms of like network television, I missed that. I missed the notion of being yeah. able to be in people's living room every week. The and speak immediacy, to them about, yeah. Yes, yeah. you know what I'm saying? There's something about that that I missed. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think we're all doing that. the best that we can. I would agree with that. I feel like it's a little bit like giving a wedding toast. Like there's different ways you can give a wedding toast. Some of them are just sort of warm and about the personalities. But if you want to, if you want to get close to the edge and kind of tease the person that you're toasting, you you really got to read the room while you're doing it because uh, those things can blow up in your face so bad, you know. Kenya, I want to say you just mentioned the the episode that ABC re-aired uh, in the wake of obviously George. Floyd's killing. You tackled police brutality uh, years ago. One of the things that you did not want to do at the time is to use the phrase or to use the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And I remember you saying at the time it's because you didn't want to politicize the show. I'm curious, if you had to do it all over again, would you still make the same choice? I mean, obviously not. <laughs> I, feel like, <laughs> I, 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 I feel like I was a supporter then and I'm a supporter now. My mom used to have this this phrase. She said that the best way to sort of go into things is to know how to exit a conversation different than you enter it. You know what I'm saying? That's the best sort of way to communicate. And I'm exiting that conversation differently than I entered it. And it kind of took, you know, Darth Vader becoming president, you know what I'm saying, um, <laughs> for me to sort of see how important it was to actually be loud. I think now, the disruption that we're seeing is really important. You know what I'm saying? I think that the idea that it is, you know, that you are saying Black Lives Matter and that we have the allies that are saying it. Like, it's so interesting to me to see so many, you know, white allies, you know, with signs that say Black Lives Matter and like, we get it. You know, like in, us saying Black Lives Matter is not saying we don't matter. It's actually saying we all matter. We hit such a nadir, you know, in terms of this, this country, you know, that we all sort of are like, okay, Fuck that. Like, you know, we need to sort of get. So I think to answer your question, like, no, I, you know, I, I, it was a Black Lives Matter episode for sure then, but I would have promoted it in a different way. Um, and maybe it was promoted at the right time for what it was, but I do feel like we have to really stand up and be advocates for, for each other. You know, I've seen with COVID in particular, you know, a friend of mine, double breast cancer survivor, she got COVID and like got put on ventilators and was basically on the, you know, they were doing something called an end of life visit where one person has, you know, they can choose one person to come stay by and the husband had to choose like, is it the 12 year old son or is it him to the wife he's been with 20 years? Like, 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 like that's a Sophie's choice. Like it's like a choice no one wants to make. But what happened was her mom kept fighting, got a specialist, and now she's on the, on the mend. The notion of that was that she had an advocate, you know, and I kind of think that advocates are really, really, really important in every aspect of life. I think we as comedy writers in particular, you know what I'm saying, we're art with a little a, but we're still artists, you know? And I kind of think <laughs> we get to make people think, and it's important for us sometime advocate for, for people who may not have a voice. And if you can make them laugh, if we can make people laugh while doing it, like that's, a, that's an amazing thing. So I think I definitely 
would have played it differently and I will play it differently moving forward on not just that, to that topic, but topics of things with women, things with you know, LGBT community, things with people with, with disabilities. So any, anything that I feel like people need someone to sort of step up and have a loud, loudspeaker, I want to sort of be that person. Has this period, these, these last few months, made you rethink uh, the stories you want to tell or, or how you want to tell them? Yes. I would definitely say that these last few months have impacted the way in which I'm going to tell stories from, you know, what I would potentially do in season three of Dead to Me, but also, you know, in future projects. I mean, I think how I, as a person who is lucky enough to control the narrative of whatever I'm doing, you know, how I can use my voice to uplift people who don't get to have one. It's something I've always tried to do in terms of women and LGBTQ stories, you know, more of the sort of women's issues stories that you, you don't necessarily get to see told from, a, from especially a female perspective. But, you know, I am thinking about my part in representation, you know, and my part in the makeup of you know the the cast and the crew and from the bottom up you know it's i'm just thinking about how to make my workplace look more like the world what about you rob tony are, are you thinking about uh different stories that, that you want to tell or, or maybe it's just how you tell the stories that you're already telling i mean our shows i guess you know it's it's a period show but i always thought it as as a contemporary show where everyone wears ribbons on their shoes. It has made me think about how we approach it. We're not literally reflecting contemporary society. There's things in the show that are about change and about a catalyst for change and why people change if they've got all the privilege. And I think in a really polarized world, drama just keeps people in their polarized nature in a way. Whereas comedy just has this ability to cut through to their humanity and to just the fucking truth sometimes in a way that drama doesn't have that capacity. So it's more like things we were always thinking about or I was always thinking about the show, but it's sort of making me think more deeply about, about them, I suppose, and about how I approach the storytelling and stuff. I'm not sure what the answers are because I think, you know, the world's moving so rapidly as we're talking about, you know. I think we have that capacity and I think that's what um, I'm thinking about a bit with second season. Yeah, and for me, I mean, I have the benefit of having uh, Danny DeVito on one of my shows, and he came on in the, in the second season of Sunny, and I remember, which was 13 years ago, and I remember him saying uh, at, one, one, at one point on set, now he's a, a comedic icon and a hero of mine, you know, I grew up watching him, and I remember being, being on set, and he said, how do you want me to say it? And I said, well, just say it whatever way you think is funniest. And he said, no, I want you to tell me what's funny. And I remember, and I remember thinking like, and, and then vocalizing like, what, you want me to tell you what's funny? And he's like, well, yeah, you're, you're the young person. And I, the reason I signed on to this show uh, was because, you know, I want to stay fresh and relevant. And if I don't, then I'm just going to become a dinosaur. So you tell me and we'll figure it out together. And so that was a real learning experience for me. And as I continue to make that show and then have made a few shows subsequent to that. I've just surrounded myself with young people. So my writer's room right now on, on Sunny, I have people uh, in the room that were not old enough to watch the show. We're not allowed to watch the show when it, when it first premiered. And that's the truth. Like I'll go out and I'll find, you know, 20, 21, 22 year old people um, of all sorts of different backgrounds just, just to literally come in and it's not, even from like, like some sort of altruistic uh, point of view or, or a pandering point of view, it's literally like this is going to make the show better and I don't want to be a dinosaur. I want you to help guide me and, and, and show me what's not only funny, but what's relevant, what's changing, how, how is it changing, and how can I continue to be, we continue to be uh, on the cutting edge of what's out there because now I'm not that young person, I'm not. I'm now the Danny DeVito looking at the kids and saying, <laughs> what's funny kids, I don't, because like we got an empty whiteboard and I don't want to fuck it up. So please tell me like what's funny so I can put it up there. Kenya, I want to go to Black AF for a second. In, in the process of, of developing it, decided you, you had to be in it. And I know that there was some debate around that. How did you ultimately land on, yes, I'm going to be the star? I ended up talking to Larry David and I had a conversation 
um, with him that was really in informative. And then Rashida, my partner, said something to me. She's also you know, a writer and really smart. She was like, isn't there already a show with an actor about your life on TV? And at the same time, I knew I wanted to say some shit I wouldn't necessarily be comfortable asking an actor to say. You know, because some of those things were such personal feelings and I knew that they would cause a lot of, you know, disruption. You know, and I was a huge fan of Larry's and I saw what he did. And I, I always was one of those kind of people, like when you're scared of something, that's what you try to go do. And so I was terrified of that. And Rashida could not have been more supportive and a pro and like walk me through it. I think if, if someone else had played that role, this, you know, for whatever the show is, it wouldn't, it still wouldn't have been even as good as it was. If it's bad to you or not, it still would have been worse. What's easier, acting or, uh, or writing for you? I think every writer should take a role, even if it's just for a day. You know what I'm saying? I think every writer should take a role, you know, because you start understanding like actual people have to say this. <laughs> having a camera pointing at me, you know what I'm saying? And like, I'm, you know, I was going through a divorce and I was having a bad day and we're arguing, but then I have to go be happy. You know what I'm saying? And like you have to sort of like have a camera that can see th into your pores. I think that writing is, I think actors are magic and it comes from inside and I can't, that part I'll never have. But I think writing, if I'm gonna be honest, I mean, writing is writing. You know what I'm saying? Writing is like you can't, it's, it's everything. You know what I'm saying? That's why I love doing these things because I get to sit and these are people that I watch you guys shows and I'm just like, what's in their head? And I, we always, when we're together, we always have the but it's, you know, the best jokes, you know what I'm saying, whatever. I, I love being in the room. You know, I, I tell every stand-up, I was like, I will do, I will, you know, every dollar, I'll, I'll give you $5 to your $1 if you want to go head-to-head -head with a comedy writer. You know, because they're, we're, <laughs> not, we're not taking the same bits and doing them over and over and over again. You know what I'm saying? That's their, their performance thing. But the way comedy writers' minds work, I feel blessed to be in the room of honestly, you know, guys who if they decided to probably could have done anything in the world, most of them. You know what I'm saying? It's a, it's a bunch of really smart, really funny, really weird, really dark, you know, my, my, kind, of, my kind of tribe of people. So I, I will, will say I think writing is, is, a, is, a, is harder. <laughs> for the rest of you, what would be your black AF or your Curb Your Enthusiasm? Mine's called It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> uh, but myth, Mythic Quest and It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia are my Kirby enthusiasms. Did you live sunny? Was that really your life? Insofar as uh, at one point in my life I was a degenerate scumbag and, and worked in a bar, <laughs> yes. But, but, I'm, but I'm, I wouldn't call myself a, a, the level of sociopath that those, the, sure, those particular sure, characters Sure, but that was, but no, was no. it really, <laughs> I, was, no, it really was, it, was it coming from your life though? Okay. No, I mean, no, not really. I mean, I honestly, it horrifies me when I hear people say, and I hear it a lot. Oh, this reminds me so much of my friends. You guys talk to each other just like my friends talk, talk to each other. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I get the spirit of what they're saying, which is like, there's a, a, an obvious rapport amongst all the actors. Cause we're, I mean, literal family members with each other and we love each other and we're having a blast. But I mean, those people are, you know, m miserable. I, I wouldn't want to be around them now. Are you guys all in the room together? No. Um, so mostly it's Charlie and I that have taken the lead on the writing in the last few years. It used to, uh, Glenn used to be a bigger part of the writer's room, um, but Caitlin and Danny have no interest. And I don't blame them. I don't understand why any Yeah, of I don't know why anyone would want to sit in a writer's room. I, <laughs> writing is the worst. <laughs> writing is by this, far, um, and look, I, again, this is coming from like a pretty bad hacky actor who's just trying to keep up with everybody else, but uh, like the, the writing is the hardest part. The, the hardest part by far. There's like a smell to a writer's room that is mm -hmm. the worst. It's like, it's like backstage <laughs> at Cavalia or like a, 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 like an NFL locker room or like after you've <laughs> like seen the Joffrey dance and they're taking their tights off and then it's, and then, and then food and coffee and just desperation and, gas and it's just it's a it's a terrible terrible smell just this I don't know There's I know but that's about... making me want to go back like that even I your know, description I'm like that's now exciting. I really miss it I miss All it right, I miss well, those do. what with God, our, yeah, with our resumes what else could we do what yeah, are we gonna... well, Liz you're also a performer yeah. I mean that's that's your yeah. background too. Just what Kenya doing? I mean, is there any appeal to that? What would it look like? What are you calling it? What Kenya's doing, and, and like him, I'm definitely inspired by Larry David. I started as a stand up and was an actor for a long time before I thought it would be 
easier to be a writer. Um, I don't know that I have the balls <laughs> to do what Kenya did, but you know, I've been a talk show host for many years online. I have a, have a, a lesbian themed uh, talk show called This Just Out where I just sort of try to espouse very gay, positive things for you know, a young audience. And I'd probably just do that uh, because I'm, I think at this point, more comfortable being myself than trying to be somebody else. But if I absolutely had to, it would probably, I would probably be in a show that was like Dead to Me, but far, far worse. <laughs> like just dead. Dead. <laughs> There's not enough money in the world <laughs> to get me <laughs> to do a show about me. First of all, I am not that interesting. I can't have lovely discussions about Shakespeare and the, you know, and the philosophy and Kierkegaard and what the fuck. So I, I'm just like literally, I, I look at, the only good thing about acting to me is like when it's cold and you yell cut, someone comes and puts a coat over you. There's other parts that, <laughs> perks that are even better than that. A actors are oh, treated, Jesus. I mean, I, I have people, like ADs helping me like walk, like cross over a curb. Like they'll point out, <laughs> hey, don't trip on the curb. I'm like, I'm not gonna trip on the curb. I've been walking on streets my entire life. I know what a curb, I know <laughs> when a curb becomes a sidewalk, a street becomes a sidewalk, there's a curb and I'll step over it. You don't have to, but it's that level of coddling that, I mean, happens all day long. And yet here you are starting in a second series, Rob. No, I'm saying that's the fun, that's the easy part. That's the easy part. Well, he's got the, he's got the curb thing down now, so he can. Yeah, start once as I many figured out the curb. Mm -hmm. Once I figured out how to <laughs> how to step on a sidewalk. The wall. waiting around fucking killed me. I'm that's just not yeah. my person. The waiting around, I was like, I was, I, literally, I was like, people just come check on me because I don't know if I'm gonna make it out of my trailer. Like it was, <laughs> it was maddening. Like it was maddening. Like sometimes, like you know, the turnovers and you're in your trailer, you know, for two and a half, three hours. And I really, when I did it, said I wasn't gonna do my, my company. So I really kind of tried to like focus on it. I was like, you know, sitting in that trailer for two and a half, three hours sometime waiting for a shot. I'm like, that took you 15 minutes to get. I'm like, this is, this is bad thing. <laughs> there's a, there's I, a lot of waiting right now. <laughs> yep. All right, Tony, I want to turn to the great for a second. We had Elle on our round table. One of the things Elle talks about is this idea that, that she's never done comedy, and this is an entirely new tone for her. She was the person you went to before yeah. there was a show. Why yeah. her? I just had always really admired her as a young actor, and I knew the show, even though it's really funny and comedic, had to work emotionally. Narratively, it's sort of an emotional drama, as well as, like, on the surface, it's a rollicking comedy I guess and I felt like she's just such a great dramatic actor that I knew she could bring and help tell that story of this woman's journey but also I, I met her and she's very she's so funny and fun in real life and sometimes actors like have never just haven't got the roles much you know like once she was in it and then she just more and more embraced it and you know with Nick and all these other great comic actors around her she just sort of fell into it and found this sort of the fun of it and the fearlessness really appealed to her because she's such a fearless person. So yeah, that was sort of why. When it comes to Catherine the Great, I think unfortunately the first thing that a lot of people know about her is this, this very sort of salacious rumor, isn't she the one who possibly had sex with a horse? I'm just gonna put that out there. You've talked about this as sort of a metaphor for our society. I'm hoping you can elaborate on that, but also how do you go from sort of knowing that and, and, and that tale to, hmm, I think there's a great show in this. And what was the um, horse's name? Because I- <laughs> Exactly. I know. And what was the date like? <laughs> no, I think it was like, well, that's all I knew about it because I don't know anything. So I knew that about her. And then I think I saw some little thing and I was like, oh, the queen who fucked a horse. Oh, yeah, she uh, kept the Enlightenment alive, brought women's education, in, brought science to Russia and also invented the roller coaster. I was like, oh, well, that seems a, a weird, interesting character. <laughs> But also at the time I thought her whole thing had been brought down to a salacious headline and I thought, well, that's sort of like our society in a way that like we go, that's the headline and we forget the depth and the weirdness of humanity and the complicatedness of it. That sort of tonal tightrope that, that you walk, how do you decide what you keep, what you discard in terms of sort of fact versus fiction? I knew a lot about it once and then I deliberately forgot. So. 
there's some people in the rooms sort of they're like I'm like what was contraception then and then they'll come back and they'll go well they cut the tops off lemons and shoved them up like a diaphragm and I'm like oh well that's good <laughs> some things are fun it's just like as as dumb as that it's like a <laughs> douche kind of thing yeah. too do, do people douche yeah. anymore is that like do they do that anymore is that just a I'm 100 years old. I just remember the dude. Rob? Shot, so anyway. Rob, Continue answer yeah, that. Yeah, I'll, 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 I'll answer that. Um, <laughs> take that one. Take that one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to take this as the perfect sort of segue to, to you, Greg, because... <laughs> oh, thanks. Of course. Um, <laughs> no, no, no. I'm perfect, on to something. Right? Just wait. I was kind of hoping that might have been edited out. So then now, But now it's got to be in because it's a segue. <laughs> One of the things you've, you've <laughs> talked about is directing sort of sex scenes and just how incredibly awkward it was for you. How have you gotten comfortable because these are the shows you're making now and these are the platforms on which you're making them? I was excited to to work that into something, you know, just thinking like, oh, I'm it's all adult now. I don't have to, uh, <laughs> you know, listen to any kind of broadcast standards. And when I got on the set, uh, they started asking me questions, the actors, and I was like, I don't know what people are doing now, you know, just <laughs> what do you think? What do you think, guys? And I mean, I was approaching it from the point of view of like, uh, well, I want to make sure everything's in character with the different characters. But then when they start saying, well, I think it would be, they would turn around and come at it from this direction and, and everything. And I'm like, I don't know. But now there's a role <laughs> called a um, intimacy consultant. So it's like a stunt coordinator. And so they come in and it's supposed to make it more comfortable for the, you know, the director and the actors uh, is that there's a, a third party in there who's, you know, going to mediate. And we, we got one of the very first uh, intimacy you know, coordinators uh, in how do you get How do you get that job? <laughs> yeah, she's got, well, I assumed that she was gonna, you know, put some maturity in there and like ask, ask everyone to tone it down. And uh, <laughs> she was just like thumbing through the Kama Sutra and going, how about this? What if we did that? And, <laughs> Tony, I think you worked with an intimacy coordinator on, on The Great, too. Well, weirdly, because it's sort of two things. On the one hand, they're kind of making them feel safe and giving them a place to kind of go to. But also, it's a, such a new role. So on the one hand, there was this kind of constant interruption that the actors would get annoyed because they're always being asked, are you OK, in the middle of things? And so our <laughs> actors would be like, can you just let us do it? But also Much sometimes like they would be like, they would want to sort of choreograph and they would be holding up, you know, at one point, one of our intimacy coordinators said, oh, well, this is Nick Holt, this is how gorillas do it, and got up on the bed and started, and we were like, whoa, <laughs> hey, whoa. I think it's like a, a thing they're trying to work out what it all means, you know. So we had to sort of have conversations about where the boundaries for intimacy coordinating were and what the actors needed to actually still do their jobs and feel safe. So it was, it, I mean, it was funny, but it was sort of interesting. We actually had a really positive experience um, on, w with us. It was, I think, just because it forces conversation. I think what we found is just having somebody that we can discuss and have a plan going into it. And once we figured that out and kind of worked through that, then we found that it was actually really comfortable for everybody to the extent that those things can be comfortable in the first place. All kidding aside, where do these people come from? I, I've never worked with, <laughs> had this before. I'm really not, where do you, be, how do you, how does one become an intimacy coordinator? <laughs> I asked one of the women um, that we, that I worked with, one of them was uh, an, an animal wrangler. <laughs> <laughs> before she had done this. And I thought, well, that's an interesting career path. You, you went from animal wrangling into intimacy coordinator. I look to each her own, I, I suppose. She, she, she was very helpful, I can, say, I can tell you that. On Space Force, we had a, um, a sign language interpreter to interpret with a chimpanzee, who was a chimpanzee astronaut. And there's a special type of American sign language that's used for communicating with chimps. So we got into that. That was... And that person was also an intimacy coordinator. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right, Rob, I'm, I'm going to ask, with Mythic Quest, you have a show that sort of presents as a series about tech bros. And, and a lot of it is really about women in tech. Did you always know that you wanted it to be that sort of kind of Trojan horse? I wouldn't look at it as a Trojan horse. I mean, what, what we've been striving to do is just make it as authentic as possible. And if you'll notice uh, in the show, the women that are in the show are very young. And that's very, very true in the industry. There, yeah, there was a movement 
probably about five or six years ago to really not only diversify um, the, uh, the, the office for, in terms of like cult cultural background and race and, and actually continent, because they were really trying to bring people in from all over the globe, but obviously to bring in as many women as they possibly could. Well, those women came into entry level positions. So if you'll notice in the show, there are a lot of dudes in their 30s and 40s and then a lot of young women. So we wanted to accurately reflect that because we felt like, of course, we want to we want to create an inclusive environment for the TV show, but we also didn't want it to feel pandering. We wanted to feel like, well, this is an accurate reflection of what these companies are. So that was just a function of, of us trying to do that. There are certain things that we all share as uh, as just human beings, and then there are certain comedic uh, instincts that I have that I think um, that I can infuse into all the characters that I write. And then there are things that we don't share, experiences we don't share, things that make everybody uh, specific and unique. And for those things, I rely on the staff. And that's why I have majority female um, writer's room and my co-creator and executive producer, Megan Gans. Uh, and I just wanted to figure out who were the funniest people to bring in the most specific points of view. You can only get that when you reach out to the, to the town and say, where are those writers that can that can bring me things that I would have never considered? I want to discuss reviews for a second. First, uh. raise your hand if you read them and be <laughs> honest. Uh, I don't read them. Well, okay, I'll, I'll half and half. I don't read them for Sunny, but I, d I did read them for Mythic Quest. Yes. Why one and not the other? Because Sunny came out in 1976. Like I mean, there was no, <laughs> there was no. There was no access to reviews. We didn't. There was no social media. There was, it was. It was 2005. And then by the time that social media uh, came out, Sunny was in season seven or eight, and I just, I just didn't care. Um, but Mythic Quest, that was the first time that I'm like, oh wow, I'm putting out something new in a, in an age where I can pick this up and at any moment look to see what somebody's thinking about it. And that's you know obviously uh, devastating. <laughs> I, I I I think it's for me. It's I I I. I it might have been even Woody Allen. No, you're not supposed to mention his name, but anyhow, he said something about uh, if you if you believe them when they say you're great, you have to believe them when they say you're terrible. And I choose to not wa want to give them that power to make me feel bad about something that I have lost my youth and my ass, and I'm like an 80 year old woman, and it's like I don't then want to like have somebody dissect something that I've put my heart and soul into from afar. I think that there's also been a shift in when you talk to reviewers nowadays, because again, there's so much product out there. They are just pissed. They're pissed that they have to sit down and watch <laughs> 5,000 shows. They're pissed that they have to watch all eight of the shows. It, it just sort of feels like Hey, we're just we're trying to entertain you, man. We're just trying to like do a little. Okay, I'm I'm over here. So I, mean, I let just I the, let me give you the yes. cliff notes on your reviews. They fuck with oh, you. Oh Jesus! If they like, you're fine. They love you're beloved, yeah. so you can start <laughs> reading them. Either either way, it's it, it doesn't matter because all I all I know is I put everything I have into my work. I love what I do. I love my actors. I love my crew. I have a we have an we have an unnatural bond on this show that's probably unhealthy because I've never had this before where we're like kind of like missing each other and like what are you doing and like which is weird because that's not really how I've ever been involved with a show before and and so like this show in particular is so kind of I'm so emotionally invested in all of the people who are doing it and my crew and and, and my DP, and he sends me pictures of his dog, like 24 hours. I don't want my friends to send me pictures of, my, of, his, of their dogs. I don't, I don't care. Is, it, is your dog dead or alive? That's all I need. I just need the headline. You know, and, and, but he'll, this is Clara when she's waiting for a treat. And this is Clara when she's waiting for her bowl. And this is Clara on her side. This is Clara at night. And, it's like, and I'm like, everything that David does is like, oh, it's Clara. It's Clara. It's Clara. So it's like, there's, I, don't want to, I don't want anyone to spoil that for me. I just don't because sure. it's 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 a good it's a good workspace head for me to be. Otherwise, everything would be disastrous. I literally want to start doing op eds on reviewers. <laughs> oh, <laughs> ooh, <laughs> oh! As much as we have to have responsibility for what we write, they have to have responsibility for what they review. I don't mind criticism. I actually like it. You know what I'm saying? Especially if it's thoughtful. 
there are some shit where it's like, dude, did I fuck your girl? Like, like did yeah, something yeah. happen that I don't, I don't know about? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, it's there very are personal something. There's a meme uh, with, with a guy. It's like a little white dude who's like a wants to be a gangster. He's like, he says, I got time today. I'm gonna call my review. I got time today. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to be, it literally is going to be reviews on reviewers. Kenya, that episode of, what, what episode number is it of Black, uh, Black five. AF? That we're, okay, so, so episode five of that show, I, I swear, and I already told you this, but I'll say it again um, publicly. I think it's the funniest episode of television that I've seen this year. If not, oh, like, thanks, it's man. up there. And like, you're, you're, but you're tackling this very thing head on. And Tyler Perry, who's amazing in the episode, is also like super inspiring. I, I know that was inspiring to me to hear him and the way that he approaches shit. And it's surprising to me that you didn't listen to any of it and you're still <laughs> pissed off. <laughs> what are you so pissed off about? The, the pissed off part was you know, a little bit hard of the character, but also not because I feel like, dude, we put our hearts and souls into this shit. You know what I'm saying? And truth be told, we know when our shit's not great. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no one's gonna be harder on you than you are. Yeah, and dude. Like, we, we, them, yeah. interestingly enough, I have the story. I, 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 the Atlantic is like my magazine. Like, like that's like the shit for me. The Atlantic, right? So I open up the Atlantic, and they do like a whole fucking like op-ed, like five-page review on my show. And I'm like, it's like a, a whole. It's not even a review. It's like a whole. Like someone went deep dive into it, and I'm like, really, dude? And like, so it's Sunday, I'm like reading it. I'm like sad. I close my laptop, and I get a text, and it's from Malcolm Gladwell. And he's like, hey, I hope you don't mind. I got your number from such and such. And he's like, you know, saying how much he loves. And like Malcolm Gladwell is like the Atlantic's god. You know what I'm saying? Like he's their dude. And I'm like, it's so sort of arbitrary and capricious. Reviewers are important because they are tastemakers. And they provide a bridge taste for people to sort of go see things. Be, be critical, but like don't let it drift into a personal place. I had a reviewer go off and like really turn on me because I had put in, had an episode of television where Chris Brown was in one of my episodes of television. And he actually did a good job, you know what I'm saying? And he was playing a character who's like himself. But the lady was like, well, he was, a, you know, he was accused of this and he's this. And I'm like, yeah, but I just put Chris Brown in the show. I didn't know, and all the things that, like, he hasn't been convicted of those things. And I, and I we know, Yeah, you didn't date character. him. I didn't date him. I didn't, like, you know, let him, <laughs> let him watch my kids. You know what I'm saying? I didn't, you know, but the idea of, this person had such a personal affront to Chris Brown, they criticized the show, and that's all the actors and the directors. And, and so I think that the notion of reviews, I absolutely watch them. I think Steven Spielberg said the same thing as you were saying, Amy, is like, if you believe any of them, you gotta believe all of them. Okay, well, let's go with that, because people will be less mad. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> Have you ever had the experience when you're casting and you think you know what, what kind of performance you want and you're bringing people in and you're basically checking it against what you think you know or you think you want and then yes. they're, they're not it and you're like not that one not that one and then later you're like well huh I didn't find it and you go back and you look at the or you change your idea about what what the role should be yep. and you go back and you look at the tapes and you're like oh there was a ton of good good people here I just was yes. I was checking it off Locked against in. one narrow thing yeah I find that that's I feel like that sometimes happens with reviewers. Like they, they have an expectation of exactly what they think you should be doing or saying or, or your show should be. And when it doesn't meet what they thought it was going to be, they're like, wow. And that's then a, later that, they, they That's a perfect it out. example. That's exactly. And, and to be honest with you, every, all of us know some of the best roles are the actors who came in and did something completely different than you thought. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And they made yeah. you rethink. Those are some of the best casting decisions we've ever made. I think that's fair. The question I was going to ask is, did you guys have a, a sense of how your things are, are going to land? Never. <laughs> no. No? I, I mean, because it's exactly what, it's exactly what they're talking about is, is that it's, it's, you're, you're talking about one person or a collection of, you know, a very small collection of people's opinion about the work of so many other people it, it's it's weirdly subjective and um you know i i wish i wasn't one of those people who raised my hand to say that yes i i do read them <laughs> um i i never plan on reading them and then you hear one little whisper or something of maybe somebody said something good or maybe somebody said something like quite terrible and then i just i don't maybe i'm a glutton or something and i i just 
I have to I have to know what people think. With a show like Dead to Me, we are um, kind of a hard show to pin down. We don't we, we're sort of genre non-conforming, and I think especially in our first season that really confused certain people, and they thought that we were confused right. maybe about our genre. But yeah. all along, I knew exactly what I was doing, yeah. you know, and I was hoping that people would would respond to it and enjoy the fact that we weren't you know pinning ourselves into one little box, but. Um, I think it became very hard for writers to reviewers to write about that. I just remember the Gilmore Girls. This was when I was young and thin, and my ass was still what it should look like. And I, I read the review for the pilot, and it started it either started like the second or third sentence was, "I wanted to hate this show, but I couldn't." Why did you want to hate Why this show? Why did you want to hate it? Yeah. You don't know yeah. me. You know, I mean. It was just the, just coming at it from such a like, oh, Gilmore Girls, it's WBAK, this is going to suck. I'm going to like, it's like, why, then don't be a reviewer. Shouldn't you come yeah. with an open heart? <laughs> Shouldn't you possibly come <laughs> with maybe, when I go to a movie, I go to a movie and I sit down, I don't care what anybody has said. I, I'm there to be entertained. I will let you entertain me. And, and I just don't understand why that isn't the feeling. It's like, come, come, come with, or if you're that unhappy, you know, there's other things to do in the world. I went to go see Popstar, which did not get great reviews. I fucking walked out of there and was like, <laughs> what the fuck? This was amazing. <laughs> and, you know, being black, I think it's even interesting, you know, because I sort of talk about it in, in that episode. There are four black reviewers who did a, after they reviewed my show badly, decided to then get together and do a round table review of my show. Oh, and I was like, That's horrible. I was like, and they said, <laughs> I got such and such together because it's like, we decided to all get together because we did not like this show and then talk about it again. And I wanted to go in. I was like, I will destroy them. I was like, you know I'm saying like the idea of how I grew up, you know what I'm saying? As comedy, as a, as my sort of, my savior and my weapon. I was like, I want to go. And I was like, but the, this is irresponsible. It's irresponsible journalism. You know what I'm saying? To get, you know, but I have to sort of top dog, underdog, take the, the higher route. You know what I'm saying? And I feel like the people that I know, I don't, Tony, I don't know people on your show, but the one thing I can say about the group of people, I know I know people who've worked for all you guys. The people who I know who work for you guys love you guys. And that means a lot because we sit there, you know what I'm saying? We've all had the shitty bosses and the bad bosses. And it's like, there's nothing worse, you know what I'm saying? But the idea that we're sitting there and like, we're giving our all, you know what I'm saying? We're sitting there, we're doing our best. We really actually care about the work. And we also care about the people that are doing it with us. And I feel like if, if you know, if one of us fails, we all fail together. So I feel sometimes compelled to, to defend my writer's room as well. Amy, the most recent season of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, in a lot of ways sort of about Midge realizing her white privilege. Uh, well, first, I guess the question is, sort of, were you a few months ahead of the conversation or, or was America 60 years Yes, behind? I was. I was. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm that good. The thing about the season was, it's more about a, somebody whose world was very small and very controlled. And suddenly you go out into the world and your eyes get opened and you meet different people and you have different conversations and you find out that what you thought was the norm is not the norm. You thought that the way you were treated is not the way other people are treated. You, you can only learn that by going out. And sometimes when you look at people who live in cities versus people who live with, you know, 200 acres and cows on either side of them, when you have to deal with people and you have to interact with people, your world is going to change and you're going to understand things and feel things more and maybe have, I don't want to say more empathy because I don't think that you're, but, but you care and you are because you you have a feeling every time you get on the subway it's like well this could be the day that the subway stops and we're all going to be walking in a tunnel together or you know something it's like you feel a little bit more a part of it all and that is what we were doing this year you know by taking her on the road and taking her in addition to her learning a little bit about show business and learning a little yep. bit about you know who your friends really are and maybe everyone who pretends that your friend is not their your your be all friend, but it really is about opening her eyes to a bigger world out there. And because everything through that on my show is funneled 
through Midge's point of view, it can kind of only happen if Midge experiences it. You know, it, it's not, it's, it's, it's a show that is strictly through her tunnel vision. Do you ever worry, or does anyone around you sort of worry how that sort of obliviousness or, or privilege uh, she exhibits at the end would make the character look? I know you and, you and Dan have sort of historically said... Um, no, I, I never give a shit about that. And especially when you're not de when you're dealing with women characters, because I well, I started on Roseanne, you know, when I was in my 20s. It was me. I had a partner for one year because I'm not a sharer of phone lines or anything. I'm an only child. What can I say? But um, you know, we were the only girls on staff, and you 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 learn really quickly what the views on women were back then. You know, what was likable and what was uh, you know don't oh, don't yell too much because you're too strident. And you know, and I learned very quickly that. If you at all reminded one of the execs in the room of his wife, you're fucked. And I've had that experience. I, I had a head of a network turn to me at one point and go, you remind me of my wife. And I'm like, and I'm canceled. Because it was just like, that's, that's you know, so it was, it, it's, it's I, so I've actually never gone into anything worried about what people are going to think uh, in, in, in those terms. Now, I, I will point out, while she's got a lot of clothes, you know, she, Midge Maisel is a Jewish woman. Ten years after the Holocaust was <laughs> where, where a lot of shit's gone down. So she's being labeled with the label of white privilege now, which I get. And yet, at the time, you know, Jews came to America. They wanted to assimilate. They wanted to be part of the American dream. And she's coming from not just privilege. She's coming from the idea that a woman should be fit into this mold and know this much and follow this line and not look outside herself. So it's, it's not just privilege that made her as kind of naive as she is. It, it was the whole time period. It was 1950s. It was what was expected of, of a girl like Midge who was attractive and easily could bag a husband and was spunky enough that she was spunky, but not, you know, too spunky that she was going to be like, oh, that girl is so spunky. Um, so it, it was a, kind of a mixture of that. You know, the, the main thing that I've been getting negative about Midge is, is about the kids. And, and I have no patience for that shit whatsoever. I never saw one person say dick about Don Draper in Mad Men not hanging out with his kids. So fuck that shit. These kids have two, pairs, two sets of grandparents that, that dote on them, and they have a father in the 50s, in the 60s, that is there all the time. If this woman has to go out on the road to make a living, fuck you if you have an issue with that. And I mean that with all the love in my heart no, that I here, can here. Convey. Who was your partner on Roseanne? Was it Betsy? No, not Betsy. I was there before <laughs> Betsy. But Betsy was the other hat person because Betsy okay. never took her hat off. That's why I was like, and are we, you guys the hat, the hat brothers, the hat sisters? I know, it was weird. <laughs> it was a little weird. But Betsy wore the same hat every day. Yes. Amy, at the beginning, different. you sort of said because you were a period piece, you, you were uh, you were sort of relieved that you were a period piece because you don't have to sort of tackle uh, what's going on in this world. At the same time, you you make a show that is crowd scenes, and often the camera is spanning through these crowds, and it's beautiful set pieces and everything else. How do you make that show in our current world? Oh well, <laughs> we're we're trying to figure that out right now. Um, well, we're breaking stories right now. We are, we're going to need a lot more space. It's, frankly, for us, it's going to depend on how much Amazon is willing to open the checkbook. It's, it's 45, 46, 47, 48. I mean, it's, it's because we can't change the style of what the show is. We can't change crowd scenes. If it comes down that you have to have 10 people as your extras, then that means that our special effects lady is going to come in and make 10 people look like 400. Mm -hmm. And that is just time and money and time and money and time and money. Has that been a problem for you in the past? Because that show does not look cheap. And if you tell me that you make that show on a budget, <laughs> no. then I fucking quit. Because that is so, like yeah, magical. Honestly. Like you, no, the, what, what yeah, you're creating with that show does not belong on television. It belongs in a cinema. And I've like told a lot of people oh, that. So I mean, like. Between that and Greg's casting budget, I'm like, I don't yes. know. Yes. <laughs> yeah, honestly. <laughs> I'm just waiting for Marlon Brando to walk on, on Space Force. <laughs> oh, that'd be good. It's, it's not a cheap show. It, it, it's not a cheap show. We're very lucky. Amazon's been very supportive financially to us because, 
you know, and, and the show from the first season to the season we just did, where we went to Florida and we went, you know, the first episode of season three, we had 850 extras in, at, at our USO <laughs> show because, because, I, because Princess didn't want to tile, which is the special effects thing, because it takes too long and I'm bored, I want to move on. So, I, and I wanted to do a one -er that came off of the Jeep and walked onto the stage and then revealed the audience and then took them off. And I can't do that with tiling, with special effects, because it it, it, special effects has to be very precise and very motion controlled. And I wanted it to be my Steadicam guy on a Jeep, following them in, getting off the Jeep, following her up, doing the reveal at a certain time. So the only way to really do that the way I wanted it to do was to get 850 dudes to stand in a freezing cold, uh, uh, bring a you know have green t-shirt show up and and uh, they didn't uh, say no so we've been we've been super super lucky there's gonna be some no's coming eventually I'm I know the no's are coming they just haven't come yet <laughs> all right Tony I want to turn to the great for a second one of my questions was the same question that I asked Amy which is as you think about doing more of this uh, that is a, a world that that's filled with 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 people with crowds with with the, you know, intimacy. How do you tell that story? Um, I don't know. It's it's difficult. It's it's like maybe everyone's in prison in season two <laughs> in their own cells. <laughs> it's hard with big background scenes and dancing, and so I don't know how we're going to do it. I mean, there is tiling, and that it is as Amy said. Sometimes it's okay, and sometimes and we've done a bit of tiling, but it's it's not the same. So. I think it's, you know, reading the, you know, I know the UK has got a big pack of guidelines in a production sense of, of things we have to deal with. So it's sort of a matter of like creatively, how do you make the best show in the safest way um, is, is kind of going to be the parameters of it. And knowing that maybe you'll have to adjust creatively in a way that is, is sort of necessary, but possibly sometimes annoying, I hopefully will sure. be able to like work it out. You know, because I think otherwise it will be like this weird thing on your shoulders that you're checking yourself all the time. All right, we're going to end on a, a last question that is that is lighter. If you could join another writer's room, past or present, which would it be and why? Sopranos. Sopranos, I think Sopranos is one of the funniest shows ever written on television. I just watched, rewatched all. I literally think that the humor in Sopranos is... There are jokes and, and moments and character moments in Sopranos that are so fucking funny, so much admiration, and David Chase is supposed to be a really dark dude, so there was like a lot of shit going on there, and I'm kind of like, oh! I would, I would have loved to have been around there. I just think, I think it's a work of art, and I know that a lot of pain went into it, but God damn it, that's a funny show. MASH, I would join. I think because, I think I grew up watching it as a kid, uh, instead of my mom to, would uh, just go, go and sit there for four years and then come back. Um, and it was on all the time <laughs> in Australia. It was late for some reason. So I think it really informed me about, it can be really funny and then you can go in and see someone die and feel it. And then you can come out and be really absurd seconds later. So for me, I always loved that about that show. And I would love to be with Larry Gelbart and kind of hang out with those guys and see what that was. Can I do a three-way? I know that's cheating. And no, two of them please, is by all so means. Two of them are going to be ass-kissing. So season two, su <laughs> season two, Sunny. What? Se <laughs> season two, Sunny. Season three, season three, The Office, American version. And then uh, Eddie Murphy years on SNL. Because season one, Sunny, was the show that sort of like, you know, they didn't give a it wasn't really story, it was super character driven. You know what I'm saying? Like you can put those characters in anything, a situation, and you can figure out, you know what I'm saying? And so the stories all lived around that characters, and I love character driven stuff. The first thing it was like, well, we're lucky we're doing this. Second season, it felt like, I don't know how long we're gonna be able to do this, so let's fucking <laughs> go for it. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and then- I'm having an uh, out of body experience. I swear <laughs> to God, I, I was 100% convinced that not one of the people on this uh, round table have ever seen anything I've ever done. I'm, and I'm 100% <laughs> <What? I'm> <laughs> honest, what? like truly Ridic. honest, like that is enough. I, I'm, I'm serious. On. I really, truly. No, it's, it's, 
I Truly mean, we're, I, writers, writers like writers, dude. It's like athletes watch, you know, I, I talked to LeBron and he fucking watches basketball. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're a fan of it, you watch it. Um, yeah. The Office, I think season three. I talked to LeBron, but we don't talk about basketball. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh. The Office season three had, had really broken completely away from, you know, and Greg, you made something that was so different from BBC. And the, by three, it, it, you had figured out your version of the sort of doc, the, the mockumentary. You're working with a lot of the same people now. I mean, Ken, I, Ken Quapis and I know. Angela and <laughs> Angela, Rashida, know. they're all on your Will show. Moore, it's great. W yeah. Will Moore was, comes around. But like it hit, I would say Black is She's One, I think is like one of the fucking greatest writer rooms ever assembled. I, don't, I think Modern Family had one of the greatest writer rooms. I think, you, I think The Office had one of the greatest writers. It, was, it goes back to like that show of shows, Sid Caesar's level yeah. of I almost I was gonna pick your show of shows as one of the shows I wish I had worked on you still can really yeah <laughs> um, I mean I, I have been the only woman in a writer's room so wouldn't you know that I guess that wouldn't deter me but I mean just because they were the originals they were the originals of sketch comedy and and it's still funny like when you watch it you know I'm not great at math. A uh, hundred years later, whatever, it, it, it's still really, it's it's still it's still hilarious. Sid Caesar is is a fucking genius, you know. And it's it I I I've, I've seen it in the last five years, and I couldn't believe sort of how much it held up. Woody Allen was and, the scrub um, in that room. Well, I know that's that's why I didn't. That's why I'm not going <laughs> to officially pick it. But my official picks would be uh, Golden Girls. Oh. That's um, mine. That's mine. Oh, that's really? so, yes. Oh my God. Yes. Just because, I mean, how much fun would that be to just write those jokes every day for oh. those beautiful, hilarious killers. characters like and, four and, and killers. all women? A killer. Kill for all killers. four killers. Did Susan Harris have a writer's room on that? Because she didn't on soap. Well, that's the, that's yeah, the interesting part were... about this question is, you know, what was worth, like, I don't even know if the Sopranos met. I don't, like, that's it, a, Yeah, I don't know I don't either. I think that that might have been a, like, they, they all took scripts and went off and mm. And went off and got angry separately? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I also want to pick, I want to pick Six Feet Under as well. Because I, I was going to, yeah, Golden Girls and Six Feet Under, which is sort of if you combine them, you know, mm -hmm. sort of like that to me a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the like Golden Girls, like just the idea that because it was a, it was the same episode over and over and over yes. and over <laughs> and over again, yes. and it, it was, didn't. There was one matter. template, and it just didn't matter. You were yeah, like no. riveted, and and for me, it was like, and I've heard this from so many other people. It was one of their favorite shows because it united every member of the family. Like everybody would love to sit and and watch that. Right. I watched it with my grandmother, with my grandfather, with my mom, with my dad. Like just with anybody, with everybody. And I can, I'm happy to say this, that um, my neighbor is Betty White. And no. to me, like oh. that, oh. like when, when I found that out, uh, that was like, I don't get starstruck that often, but like that, I had a moment. I had like, I had like the vapors. I had like, I was <laughs> like, I couldn't believe it. And, and I, I'm happy to report that we check in on her from time to time and say hello and she's doing very well. For me, I, I got. I have an awful lot. I mean, I thought Monty Python, but but I think that would be super fun to observe. I don't think I would have been an actor, so I uh, they all acted and wrote together. Right. Um, I feel like All in the Family or the Mary Tyler Moore Show that era. Speaking of Betty White, would be an amazing experience. I, you know, I'd love to like since it's sort of a time travel. Now you're asking about time travel. Like I would want to yes. go back and see the Jack Benny program and I Love Lucy and just. What was that? What was that like? That would be just cool. To I love see. Lucy would be great. I love Lucy yeah. would be really good. Thank you guys all for being part of this conversation and hopefully we'll get to do it again when we're actually all together. Thank no. you everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Please. Thanks. That would be great. <laughs>